Hi, I'm Jeff Johnson. I live in Ventura, California. I'm a staff photographer for Patagonia. I've uh, been involved in a few projects. My first book was called Ben de Baja, and that was published in 2005. And my latest project, 180 South, is a coffee table book that accompanies a film that we've been working on the last couple of years. And I shoot travel, lifestyle, climbing, surfing, anything outdoors. I've been a photographer about six or eight years. And I'm going to sit down and have a conversation with Mark. Welcome to the Mark Silver Show, Advancing Your Photography. We connect you with photographers who have mastered their craft, sharing their insight and showing you their photography tips so you can go right out and use them. Hey, Jeff, thanks for inviting us here for yeah. Advancing Your Photography. Yeah, anytime. So tell me about your approach to photography and the type of work you really love to do. I like to do all sorts of different types of work. I shoot travel and um, sports, climbing, surfing, and I like mo more of a photojournalistic style to things and kind of like to be a fly on the wall. And I think lifestyle and my favorite is lifestyle and portrait portraiture. I think that's probably what I like most about it, but I like just getting out there and traveling and documenting it. Telling stories. I like telling stories. I think, uh, you know, you can take a picture and it's just a picture, but I like t telling a story with a photograph or a series of photographs. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at how you do that. So how do you get a story out of whatever you're going after? Um, comes in different ways. Sometimes I'll just, you'll be hanging out with somebody and you'll realize, wow, there's a story here. And then you just try to document as well as you can. or. Um, Usually the, usually the best stories come from just hanging out. They never come from sitting around thinking about it. It's mm -hmm. Usually it just pops in your head while you're on the road somewhere. You, you might be in a place and find something that's really interesting and you want to document it or you meet somebody and you realize you got a great story. It's, it's, um, I think the best stories are never something you go out and try to find. They just kind of find you. That's what, what I've found the most interesting ones. They're usually the ones that pop up last minute, you know. Cool. And you just kind of got to be on it. Yeah. So what are some of the key things that you use every time you pick up a camera or even before you pick one up? It's kind of uh, basically what is the story? What's going on here? Is it the place? Is it the person? Is it what they're saying? You know, I'm, I'm also a writer too, so I tend to write stories also. So um, that's something I can use if I, if I don't get that photographically. Mm -hmm. I can also write about it. So just kind of I think you have it have to have an idea of what you're trying to say with a particular subject and you have to start with that and then everything else will follow suit after that but yeah you kind of have to know that going into it like right off the bat what are we what am I trying to find here and trying to say well let's talk about 180 degrees south which I totally love that movie oh thanks thanks so you had a story obviously already in mind yeah yeah that that um you know, it was in, that that whole trip was inspired by a film made in 1968. So, it was it was the spirit of the, of that journey that propelled us on our journey to to record something new, and to meet up with the the guys that were on that 1968 trip. So, that was um, that was interesting because up to that point, I'd been um, I'm a staff photographer for Patagonia, and, and I'm used to assignments and whatnot, and um, when I started shooting, before I became a photographer or a paid professional photographer, I, sh I just traveled and took photos and wrote in my journal. And, and that's how I started with photography and I never thought it'd become a profession. And then it became a profession, which is a dream come true. And then I was on this trip and it was a real different thing for me to not have a particular assignment because I was in the film mm -hmm. and I didn't really have a, an assignment my assignment was whatever I wanted it to be. So I just, for six months, I documented things that I thought were in interesting along the way. So there's so many characters and people and places that I just had a blast with it. And it was great not having the pressure to shoot. Sometimes I wouldn't pick up the camera for weeks. And then sometimes I would just shoot for days on end. And so it was really nice. It was kind of getting back to my roots of photography and. I started shooting film again on that trip because I'd been so entrenched in digital right before that. But I went back to film, you know, brought a digital, I mean, a film camera on that trip, and 
So it was, it was great for me going back to kind of why I started photography in the first place. Mm -hmm. Jeff, that's a rough job, but somebody's got to do it, right? It is rough, yeah. Travel for six months, <laughs> yeah. shoot whatever comes to mind. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, yeah, I, I took a leave of absence from work. So I, um, I, I was totally free to do whatever I wanted to do. So I was, I was on, a, I think, an eight-month leave. So transitioning from being primarily a still photographer to actually shooting a film or being involved in a film, was it, was it difficult to make that jump? Yeah, it was a little strange. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I didn't know I was going to be the main guy in the film until mm -hmm. right before we started. Um, Chris Malloy and I had been talking about making a f this film for 10 years or something, and Chris, is a, he's made so many um, successful surf films, and we've been talking about this. And I, I just wanted to be part of the dream. I wanted him to make this film. I didn't know what my position would be in the film. Maybe I'd be the photographer or the writer or something. And um, at the last minute, he changed his mind. He said, this is going to be, you're going to be, in the, it's your dream. Why don't you do it? And he was right. It was, it was our dream to do this. And he said, this is your dream as much as it is anybody. So you're going to be the guy we're going to follow. So that was a little daunting hmm. for me um, to be a, the guy in the film. And um, so that took a little getting used to be, being filmed. And, and it was tough, too, you know, when the, the light's perfect and there's all these great things going on, you want to pull out your camera. But a lot of times I was in the shot, right. so I couldn't shoot, you know. And, and that was a little frustrating sometimes because, you know, I'd grab my camera and Chris goes, no, you're, you're actually... You're the star here. You're in the shot. So... Um, that was tough sometimes. I, I did take one shot that was one of my favorite of the trip. I had a, a like a, a point and shoot. Yeah. And we were walking up a glacier with our ice axes and stuff. And the light was just beautiful. And I just held it at my waist out of the view of the camera and just clicked off a few at my waist and just got a couple gems that way. And I just couldn't resist. Chris had no idea I was <laughs> doing that. Yeah. Nice. But one thing I wanted to ask you about is you did a lot of voiceovers. and. Yeah. And you're really natural. You come across with a really natural voice, oh, just thanks. like we're talking. I find that very difficult, personally. Oh, it was really hard. How did you do it? So what was, what, it was what's thanks the Thanks for telling me. It's, I mean, I appreciate yeah. that it sounded natural, because um, it's, it's, it's not a natural thing to do. I know. It's, it's really, that whole project we did with the book and the film and the six months of travel, that the voiceovers afterwards were the hardest part of the whole thing. Um, it's one thing when you're getting interviewed, you know, a lot of Yvonne's um, voiceovers in the film, he's being interviewed and he's talking to people and he's yeah. got things to talk about. He might be having beers around, of a fi around a fire, but it's different when you sit in a studio and you have a microphone and you're talking past tense and all that and present and you, you really have to capture the audience. And, and my first round of voiceovers were horrible. Mm -hmm. And um, we did months and months, I think probably four months of voiceovers wow. of uh, read We were also rewriting things, you know, because um, we took a lot of those from my journals and crafted them into voiceovers. And my experiences from my journals and made them into voiceovers. So it was um, a lot of going back and rereading. And uh, I mean, you do a, you, you read a paragraph 10 times and then you read one sentence in that paragraph 20 times and then do all five of those sentences 10 times each and then you go through the paragraph again 10 more times and then you come in the next day and they go we rewrote it we're going to do something different and, and uh, but but getting my voice to sound relaxed and normal exactly. it's, it's easier when you're talking like we are but yeah. but when you're sitting you know in a microphone sometimes in a booth trying to act like you're there or make it feel like you're there is really really hard it's kind of like acting with your voice yeah so i did a I watched a lot of films, some of my favorite films, and really listened to the voiceovers on how it, they're amazing when you know it doesn't sound odd. You know, when you want to hear their voice even more, yeah, that's a good voiceover. When you don't notice anything, it just seems really casual, and that's really hard to do. It is. And, and mine were really horrible for a while, you know. Well, the final but, version, uh, really, I paid attention to it because I noticed these things. Oh, thanks. Thank you. But I think the other clue there is maybe because you were working from your journal, it had that natural origin, at least. Yeah, they're adapted. You know, Chris, uh, when I came back, he goes, let me see everything you wrote, and I want to go through it. And he sat with a writer, and and they crafted somewhat of a... Because he was... You know, we, we had the story. We did the trip already. We had 200 hours of footage. 
but you need to make it clear of what's going on because there's so many things that happen in six months. Yeah. So you need to start writing. Like, w what is the story here? You know, and it would change. So he sat with a writer and and they would write some stuff, and then I'd come in and I'd change things to fit my personality, and you know, we and then Chris and I would rewrite, and then it'd become mine again. Yeah. And then um then I'd redo it and redo it, redo it, redo it. <laughs> you know. Well yeah. done. That's I, that Thanks. was tricky. Yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah, if you can appreciate that, it was, it totally. was tough. So back to still photography for a moment. Any particular tips in terms of capturing really great light? Um, well, you know, the, the best light is always you know in the morning and at night, um, sunrise and sunset. Um, you know, it's it's hard, especially if you're you want to shoot it photojournalistically because it. It happens when it happens. You're not always going to have the best light. Um, pray for clouds. You know, <laughs> like uh, I know a lot of people think, oh, it's this beautiful, perfect day. But a lot of those days are really boring. You want really cloudy days. Those are the best. You can shoot in midday, and it's like having this nice soft box on your subject. How about composition? Have you developed any kind of sort of approach that you find works? Yeah, I think it's just uh, really basic. Just um, simplicity you know you want your photographs or at least I want mine it doesn't always work this way but to be really simple and um, if you look at the best photographers there's very little going on in the in the photo so it's an easy read sometimes the photo might the whole point of the photo is being complicated so maybe that is what you're trying to show is the busyness and the, how complicated something is but um, if that's not your goal um, you want things to be really graphic I mean, this is just my opinion but real graphic looking, real simple, you know, it's, it's like, like looking at you right now, if I was going to take your picture, my cabinet over there sticking out of your head, you know, right. so I might move you this way or that way, just to get some clear um, background or um, simplicity is the best. And that's, that's, I think, the, the thing I try to concentrate on is not having too much going on. There's some photographers that only like to have, there's one in particular, and I, sh I shouldn't know his name, National Geographic guy, but he, he always has three colors in his shots, hmm. always. Only three colors, hmm. every one of his shots. Not all of them, but his best shots are all three colors, so he's really into that, you know, so. But just keeping things si simple, and it's, it's kind of hard to do when you got things moving, and mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe if things are too busy, you get down low and you look up, so people's heads are against the sky, or right um changing angles changing angles you know and, and um you know getting higher going lower or whatever because i like to shoot kind of walking around if i'm doing something that's happening photojournalistically you know and um that's you know the, the simplicity is key and then also for me it, it depends on what you're trying to get at to the uh yeah i like i think the best photographs is where you don't the last thought when you're looking at the photograph is the photographer it's not something people are thinking of, like, how did you get that shot? Or it's like they're not even, they're looking at that photo and they're in it and they're not even, yeah. they're not even thinking about a photographer. And, and um, sometimes I'll shoot stuff just standing and, and looking at people and not trying to get a tricky angle because that's what it would be like if you were there. Yeah. You know, if I was talking to you right now, I'd take a picture instead of getting tricky with it, you know, because then it feels like you're there talking to you, you know. You know, I asked Chris Burkhart, we were talking about getting a cover shot, and he, you know, kind of gave me the ingredients, and the last one was the mojo. The mojo. The mojo. <laughs> so what is it for you that's the mojo when you, when you get that photograph that really pops? I think it's some kind of emotion, and I think, because um, I, I think Chris is, is uh, he's having, th he's really into, like, wide landscapes and stuff, and having things going on with color and, and light and uh, action and stuff. And I think mine, um, we both, he shoots other things too, and I shoot different things. But I think mine, my, what I like best is people and getting some sort of emotion out of the people or, um, yeah, there's, yeah, it's hard to pinpoint that mm -hmm. thing that's happening, you know, but you know when you got it, you know, and, and it's, um, it's usually not when you're setting something up, right. you know, like, I'm sure Chris has this happen. You have this idea, you go and you set it up, and something else happens, and that's your shot. Right. And that's the mojo. You know, that, that shot that you thought about, that you set up, is not the shot usually. From my experience, you know, it's, it's what you didn't plan on, and if hopefully you capture that thing that you didn't plan on. So it's being prepared for that. Being prepared. 
Like yeah. the other day I was shooting um, um, this guy, Fred Becky. He's uh, shooting his portrait and he's a, a climber. Patagonia's doing a book on him and he's just this classic guy. He's late 80s and, and he's just a gr just such a classic looking character with his features and stuff. And I was shooting portraits and s people were talking. I was standing back and I saw him just he's just tired you know he's just tired you know and it's late in the day and he just felt like that and i clicked those shots off and they're some of my favorite because he's he's really doing instead of looking at the camera he was like wiped out and he was just yeah. tired yeah and he had his hands on his face and old hands and and i got that real quick and and um those are i think those are, that's the mojo the, the i think that's what chris is talking about yeah awesome those unexpected moments so Jeff, can you walk, kind of walk us through a step-by-step -step of how you approach a photojournalistic assignment? Yeah, like I said, everyone's different, you know, and um, I think for, uh, depends if you're on a surf trip with a bunch of guys, depends on if you know them really well or not. Um, like say I'm going to begin a trip, if I don't know the guys really well, we'll just talk about it and go, hey, what are you guys cool with? You know, can I, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be shooting photos this whole time. Do you mind if I get in your face with it? You know, and some people are, don't even care. Some people I've shot with, um, you know, I've shot with climbers that, that uh, they want to climb. They don't want to be bothered. Right. And you have to really be a fly on the wall. And they're totally cool with it, but they don't want you saying anything to them or directing. So I think having really good communication with your subjects beforehand and really knowing what they want, what they expect, and you telling what you expect too. Like some people are love to go out and make photos tell me what to do let's go climb where do you want to go and some people are like i'm going here i don't want to even hear you and see you which is great too so you just have to um, communicate that beforehand with your subjects you know and then something else you know a, a different scenario is places where you're going where you don't the people don't know you're going to shoot them or yeah um and that that is different every time i think you, it's just like i said you got to go in there expecting you know, not expecting anything, just expecting to get something. Like you just got to be on the ball and get things when it happens. Be aware. Sometimes using a small camera in those environments are good. Like using my um, my Leica M7. It's a really small camera. It's really unassuming and, yeah. and quiet. And and sometimes that you don't look like a serious photographer with that. Whereas if I had my my 5D with my big lens on it or something, it's you know it looks like you're you know you're kind of imposing. So. Yeah. The camera kind of makes a difference sometimes. That was Cartier Bresson's little tiny Leica that he could just hold. Yeah, you know. he was the master of being sly. He had that figured out. He'd take your picture when he didn't even know it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so taking photographs in pretty challenging environments like climbing El Cap or surfing. So what about climbing and shooting at the same time? That's got to be really tricky. It is. You know, climbing, um, climbing and shooting, t it depends on where you're doing it, but... Um, like going up on a wall is equivalent to swimming out a pipe or something, you know, it's really involved. I think, you know, there's photographers that have, I think they even started to do it in some magazines, paying more money for water shots than they did for land shots. Because hmm. there's more that goes into it. You know, you're sitting on land with your 600 or you're in the water with your fish eye. You know, yeah. it's, they both have, they both look beautiful, but one's, you know, a little more involved. So going up on a wall is a little more involved. You know, you, you, um, you have a lot of stuff with you. You have, you, you know, you you want a light kit, you know, you want a, just a couple lenses and, and um, you, yeah, you, and plus you're, you're high up there and, you know, doing a wall like El Cap, you know, um, you're up there sometimes for five days or something, you know, it's not just a one day thing. So there's a lot of rigging involved and, and you know, getting away from the party that's climbing, you know, that's the most important thing is getting away yeah. from them else because you're like this on a ledge, you can't do much with that. So it's, um. I mean, shooting climbing is really involved, and um, there's a lot, lot to, lot going on. Um, but it's physically demanding, like swimming out in the water with your housing. You know, it's like the same kind of thing, but the housing's a little simpler. You just have your housing and your swim fins. Yeah. You know, it's not as gear intensive, but it is a physical thing, and and um, harder to, to really, compose your shot. You know. But climbing, you have time. You know, it, the the wall's not going anywhere. Whereas the wave only happens once. What have been some of your biggest challenges that you've had to overcome as a photographer? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's the elements that's challenging, um, especially 
if you're working with natural light, I don't work with any kind of uh, lights or flashes or anything, so I'm really dependent on um, the environment. So the biggest challenge for me, which would get, that can get tough on trips, is uh, the elements not working with you, mm -hmm. just going against everything. Just like I said before, there's all this great stuff happening, but the light is crap, and then the light's beautiful, and then there's nothing happening. And, you know, the light finally gets good, and there's a lull until dark and out in the surf. Or that's, I think, the, the most, stru most uh, frustrating thing is that's all you have to work with, and when it's not good, it's not good. You know, and it's where if, if you have um, lights and flashes and stuff, you can just make it happen and create your your photograph. And uh, and when you don't work that way, it's you're at the mercy of nature. So that can be really frustrating. You know, I was just talking to Chris Burkhart the other day about going on surf trips and just getting skunked. Yeah. You know, you're going to get surf images and there's no surf. It's you know, it can be really frustrating. Can't so, take it. So I'd say the elements. Okay. Are the the most frustrating for what I do. What are some of the emotions that you've hit as a photographer? Well, I think like, I think most photographers are, you're always wondering, is your stuff good or is it, you know, you, you, everybody has their insecurities, you know, you, you see these great photographers and then you go out and shoot and you're like, wow, I didn't get, get anything. And you're like, oh, they must shoot, every photo just must be amazing that they, you know, you think like these great photographers, everything they shoot's amazing, you know, but it, it's a, uh, I think you'd be amazed when you, if you saw a lot of their stuff, like if you saw their entire shoot, what they actually do, they're human just like us. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no magic to it. It's, um, everybody's using the same equipment and, and um, some people are a little more magic, but uh, it's, uh, I think trying to, you know, you put pressure on yourself to be better and sometimes that can be hard. And, and I think what you have to do is kind of look back I think I think some every photographer I think some of their best photographs are the first ones they ever shot, and um, because you don't know and you're not trying to please a client or you're not trying to get it in this magazine that magazine you're just shooting from the heart and uh, I think you got to always remember that and sometimes I'll go back when I'm feeling frustrated or whatever I'll go back and look at some of my old photographs when I didn't I had no idea what was going on and you're like well I I got some good photographs there. And that's the beauty. I, when people, when I see people um, start shooting beginning, I'm kind of jealous because I know they're just going to get such great stuff because they're unencumbered, you know. So I think letting all that drop away, all all these things that you've been building up over years, trying to be a photographer, and just dropping, just letting it all fade away, and just going back to how you shoot, like naturally what you like, and just keeping it like that. But it's hard. It's hard because you, as you develop as a photographer, you're dealing with different editors and different publications and you kind of will start shooting that way yeah and you gotta always go back to what you what your heart is and what you do you know what you like and yeah sometimes you, you can get lost with that I know I have in the past you know you always got to go back yeah good good advice okay I'm really interested in your kit when you're going climbing so what do you got in there well climbing mostly I'll, I'll shoot um, digital and I'll have my 5d with a, with an assortment of lenses usually zoom lenses because it's Hard to use a bunch of fixed lenses on that. I have a 17, a 16 to 35, and a 24 to 70. And um, since it's digital, I have no film. I just have my SanDisk cards. I only shoot with them. And and um, sometimes I'll bring a fixed lens, like a 50 or 85, up there. But it's usually a small kit on the wall. And then surfing, that's a whole nother. What know. do you got in your surfing kit? Uh, uh, Canon uh, Mark IV and a 600 lens. 70 to 200, uh, fixed 85, a fixed 50. I, there's a lot of lenses yeah. I kind of lose track, and I have SPL housing for that when I go in the water. Cool. Jeff, any final tips for photographers who just want to get better outdoor photographs? Shoot. Just shoot, 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 shoot. Yeah. That's the best thing you could do. And, find, and subjects. Finding subjects is a, every outdoor photographer needs somebody to shoot. And that's the hardest thing is having somebody shoot a lot of times. You can be a great photographer, but if you have nothing to shoot, then you don't have a photograph. Yeah. So that would be probably the most important for outdoor action stuff, I think. Cool. For sure. Hey, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. You bet. Appreciate your time. Be sure to subscribe to our blog now to stay updated on my show. 
and we'll give you tips and insight to keep advancing your photography. Also, check out our guests' website for a closer look at their work. Tune in to our next episode of Advancing Your Photography for an inside look at another photographer's world. Until then, this is Mark Silver reminding you to get out and capture your own images of life.